Right, thanks everyone for uh, for joining us today. Um, this is the uh, fashion shakeup. How will see now, buy now, disrupt the fashion industry? And what does it mean for your day job? Um, this event is brought to you today by Centric Software. Um, hopefully everybody can all hear me. Um, if there's any pre any problems with your, your video, uh, audio or anything of that nature, please drop me a note through the Q&A box, um, which is on your um, part of the menu for GoToWebinar. Um, in addition to that, we're also going to be holding um, a Q&A at the end of today's session, and uh, this will take up around about 10 to 15 minutes, uh, where our presenters will hopefully answer some of your questions. If for any reason we can't get through all those questions, I will be passing them directly back to the experts um, who will be able to respond to you um, personally after the event. So I hope you're all ready for today. I'll um, introduce you very briefly to today's speakers, um, if you're not already aware. Um, let me introduce you. We have Lisa Garson. And Lisa is a seasoned fashion operations executive with extensive experience in both men's and women's fashion uh, for apparel, with long stints at Polo Ralph Lauren and the Jones Group, Nine West Holdings. A highly accomplished fashion expert, Lisa has experienced numerous changes and is well acquainted with the use of ever-evolving technology to meet industry challenges. In addition to leading PLM, ERP, planning and other system implementations, Lisa has been an active part participant in industry forums such as the GS1 Committee on Extended Attributes. Um, now, Stacey Charbin, who is the CMO at Centric Software, uh, she is other, your other speaker for today and she has approximately 20 years experience working with brands and also retailers globally. So today's uh, presenters are both very much experts in their field, so I hope they can teach you something important today. And um, we're always helpful, always like to hear your feedback. So as I say, any questions, please pop them into the questions box. And uh, I'm Heather, and I will be passing you uh, through to our speakers shortly, and I will put the questions to them at the end of today's session. So um, without further ado, I will pass you over to um, Stacy and to Lisa, who will uh, take you through their presentation for today. And uh, enjoy. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Heather. Can you just confirm you can hear me OK? Uh, I assume you can. Um, I can so hear you fine. My name. Sorry, I can hear you Excellent. fine. Everybody's saying yes, Excellent. I can hear you, so go for it. Excellent. OK, let's go for it then. So um, my name is Stacey Charbon, and I am uh, Chief Marketing Officer at Centric Software, and I am speaking to you from Paris, France today, where it is actually pretty crappy outside. Um, and then we have Lisa Garson, who is in New York City today. So Lisa, do you want to say, say hello so everyone can hear your voice? Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, actually, it's it's morning for you. Hope you've had a chance to have your first cup of coffee. <laughs> um, so let's jump right into it. So um, this webinar today is about it's about disruption in the fashion industry. So uh, you know, I'm sure I'm sure all of you have heard about the disruption that's happening in, in many many other industries um, with today's sharing economy. We know that uh, life today is not the same that it was even a mere you know three or five years ago. Um, for example, you know, Airbnb, Uber, uh, all the taxi strikes, of course, that seem to be following uh, the Uberization of the world, um, ordering food at home. Today, uh, today's consumer is more likely to order uh, takeout, actually, more often than to go to a restaurant and actually go out to eat, even though overall we cook less. The idea of renting a car or a bike or even a scooter, for example, here in Paris, um, we just I just rent an electric car for the for the couple of minutes a day that I need one, um, and then of course the same thing is happening to the fashion industry with companies like Rent the Runway. So now it's fashion's turn to be disrupted, and even some general publications. I read an article about um, on Bloomberg this morning that talked about, <laughs> duh, why didn't this happen sooner? Why did it take the fashion industry so long um, to go through this kind of change? So I'm going to turn it over to Lisa now, who's going to tell us 
about this change and exactly what is going on. So we're going to start with the fashion calendar. It's easy to overlook how important that is. Scheduled fashion shows have existed for so long they've become part of the landscape, but the annual runway calendar remains one of the main forces that shape the fashion world. Private fashion shows have existed in one form or another since the 1800s when Parisian salons would invite a select audience to see their shows behind closed doors. Then public shows emerged around the turn of the 20th century with specialty stores, department stores, and hotels exhibiting designers' wares. The fashion week concept that's since become so central to the way the industry operates has its roots in the middle of the 20th century. The display of seasonal collections started in New York in 1943 and then became mandated by the Chambre Syndicale de la Haute Couture in France two, two years later. Today, Fashion Weeks take place in New York, London, Milan, and Paris, and are expanding to other cities, and have become the de facto destination for designers, brands, and houses to launch their collections for future seasons. While people tend to think of catwalk shows as being primarily for the luxury industry and the highest end of haute couture, what we define as mid-range brands also operate a show cycle. They exhibit products and collections ahead of their availability at retail in anywhere from two to eight um, market events per calendar year. Although these shows used to be mainly for buyers and media, now they're increasingly for consumers as well, and that is one of the main elements contributing to the shift in the cycle here. Um, the show cycle is seasonal. Designers and brands generally showcase their autumn and winter collections in the spring and so on. Um, these shows also set very important hard stop deadlines for the suppliers. You have to have product to show, and the show in turn then sets commercial deadlines. You have to stop improving the product, making changes or tweaks to it, or you won't have anything to sell. This seasonal cyclical approach has been in effect for more than seven decades, and much of the rest of the fashion industry has followed suit. Seasonal collections shown one or more seasons in advance are the norm, and a great deal of the essential processes of fashion are built around this model. Although the calendar has shifted a bit over the years so that goods are getting to the shop floors earlier and earlier, as retailers have vied to be the first to the floor with new product, They've pushed suppliers to deliver earlier and earlier, resulting in things like having heavy coats and sweaters on the floor in the middle of the summer. Let's move on and talk about another big phenomena impacting the fashion calendar, fast fashion. I'm sure everybody is aware of the impact that brands like Zara and H&M and, and Forever 21 have had. Uh, it's impossible to talk about the fashion calendar without addressing this. It's had an enormous impact on consumer expectations. Fast fashion, it, although it's a more recent influence on the industry, it succeeded in reshaping the industry incredibly quickly, delivering cut price copies of catwalk styles to market far more quickly than the exhibitors themselves can manage. In order to keep pace with this, those designers and brands who operate show cycles have been forced to make those shows more frequent to cater to consumer expectations. These companies have redefined what a shopper can expect in terms of price, refresh velocity, and variety. And as a result, the frequency of runway shows has increased, in some cases from two per year to eight or more in that same period. And although fast fashion and the high end don't necessarily target the same customers, consumers increasingly mix and match high and low end. In fact, and more importantly, analyst evidence suggests that fashion's share of overall consumer discretionary spending is dropping, while contrasted with increases in more fast-paced industries like entertainment, hospitality, and consumer technology. In fact, a recent Kurt Salmon study cited a loss to the fashion industry of nearly $300 billion in the last 10 years, and that is in the U.S. alone. So if fast fashion has become disruptive, then the idea of immediate fashion, or see now, buy now, has the potential to be even more so. So this is, it's not just a lot of uh, press, it's not just a lot of buzz, but, um, but this is really happening. 
So beginning with the most recent autumn winter collections around uh, January uh, timeframe, some brands have started offering either single pieces, capsule collections, or entire collections for sale. Albeit in many cases, there are just a few, these are offerings are just available in a few flagship, short, flagship stores um, just for the time being. Um, but the point is that these clothing, these clothes now, or these looks, are actually offered from the moment they're first seen on models, and then um, the brands intend to continue down this path more and more. So this is really changing the foundation of the way their businesses operate. And this is not a phenomenon that's just limited to a couple of very large brands. There are, of course, large companies like PVH, which, as you know, uh, is Tommy Hilfiger and Calvin Klein but also smaller companies like Perenza Schooler and uh, Tom Ford are also doing. So this is, this is really something that's impacting all kinds of businesses in the fashion industry. So their aim is to turn the fashion show from a passive event or an event that's really just meant for press into an active participa participatory one, so more of a commercial event, so that consumers are able to shop what they see on stage either the same day or within stores, online, offline, or both. So unlike the traditional runway cycle, where media channels had months in which to analyze, promote, and discuss new styles, um, of course, you have many um, really cool fashion journalists like Kathy Horn, for example, who would go critique the runway shows. Um, now, consumers will, will have access, of course, to goods uh, at the same time that these critiques are, are coming out. So it'll be very interesting to see what the impact will be on the, on the sales cycle. There are even some brands um, that intend to do see now, buy now collections directly live on primetime TV. So that's even more of a, a, of a disruption that's happening in terms, of, in terms of immediacy. So this is undoubtedly transforming relationships with consumers, or it will. Um, some designers are hosting, in, in fact, in-store viewing events so that their customers, at the same time they reveal new designs, will also have access to goods. And of course, the press is going to be right there along with key customers. So for a fashion company, a fashion brand, this is a potentially great way to connect in a very intimate way um, with your very best customers. So Lisa, what's going on in the press? Thanks, Stacy. Well, as you, quote, as you cited several examples, the brands are talking about this, but not just the brands. The press is talking. The shift to a more immediate model has industry press clamoring to understand its implications, and it's even reached mass market media. While nobody's really settled on a name or a definition for this, the consensus appears to be that the move towards immediacy will, will in the long term, impact more than just the select group of brands who are currently talking openly about it. The business of fashion, an influential publication, has called it a new world order. Analysts and celebrity designers have referred to the existing system as antiquated and have taken steps to consolidate their collections and exhibit them when they believe it best suits the consumer. The undercurrent of this discussion is that what's currently happening at the high end may eventually cascade down into the mid-range and mass market. In fact, anywhere there's a gap between runway or market and retail. While a quick trip to Google will show us who's pushing for the new model, it's not always clear why. So we'll talk about why. We've examined the various justifications that designers and brands have given for what they see as the necessary move to a see now, buy now model and added some of our own interpretations. The most obvious in light of the impact that we know that fast fashion has had on the industry as a whole and particularly on luxury is that the current gap between runway and retail, often a matter of four to six months, allows other co companies to copy or knock off or steal styles and using more agile production methods get subtly tweaked versions of these styles into stores before the designers who originated them have the chance to do the same. In the minds of the brands who operate these shows, this amounts to giving away their lifeblood. They showcase the results of months worth of creative efforts, only to have cut price versions of it arrive on other retailers' shelves first at significantly reduced prices and quality levels. It's not surprising then that those organizations condemn the current calendar as being broken. They believe that this delay, or at least the length of it, is unnecessary 
and they argue that they're capable of restructuring their operations in a way that allows them to make some portion or all of their collections available to buy immediately. In essence, they believe the current fashion calendar is obsolete, made for a different world than the one we live in today. They also argue that this see now, buy now model is required if fashion is going to compete for the attention and wallets of consumers who are now accustomed to instant gratification in other areas of their lives. From taxis to TV, fashion brands are competing not only against each other, but also against other consumer-focused industries that don't have a built-in delay between the excitement of seeing a new product and the gratification. Those in favor of the see now, buy now model also argue that keeping pace with velocity and variety of fast fashion has led to fractured product offerings. We mentioned earlier multiple shows, the number of shows increasing. There are pre-collections and mini collections in addition to the main collections in order to maintain consumer interest. They envision a single, immediate, seasonless collection synchronized across menswear, women's wear, accessories, footwear, and other product categories. This could be a huge opportunity to revitalize their entire model. So then on the flip side of these arguments, um, of course, are those who are against this uh, and don't praise, praise these changes. So there, there has been um, a pretty public debate going on between the, the people that are for and the people that are against. So it's definitely made for some interesting reading and some interesting discussions. Um, those against say that this idea of immediate, immediacy is, is exclusive, unfair, impractical, or just frankly runs counter to the whole idea of fashion, which is, a craze, of course, an industry that, that, that's created and based on newness. So broadly speaking, um, these people, which are mainly luxury brands, um, some mid-range brands and some luxury groups, and then of course you have the governing bodies, such as the Chambre Syndicale de l'Haute Couture, and then the Camera Nationale de la Moda in Italy, so basically the French and the Italians, um, which are not insignificant. They are arguably two of the most powerful fashion markets and the most influential fashion markets in the world. They have reaffirmed their faith in the current system, saying that they believe the runway to retail cycle exist for a good reason. Um, and although the fashion share of consumer spending may have slimmed down, it might be weaker than it was in the past, luxury spending still, despite some fluctuation, uh, is strong. It re luxury remains popular. And scarcity does create desirability. Of course, this was very loudly echoed, the sentiment was loudly echoed by Caring's uh, Francois-Henri Pinault in the business of fashion. Um, so those against immediacy also remind us that the gap between run rail, runway and retail is still very much needed. It's important to remember that in the months following a fashion show, following Fashion Week, um, it's not a time where these, these clothes are just sitting in, in inventory waiting to be delivered. Uh, in fact, there were, traditionally there was nothing to buy right after re, a runway show. It, it, clothes cannot be sold because they do not exist yet. So it's traditionally after the show um, that the final tweaking of the product or the commercialization of the product begins and then of course goes into production, hence the delayed uh, availability at retail. So for this reason, they argue that see now, buy now is not practical at all and, it, and may effectively be impossible um, for many businesses to achieve because the older model is so fundamentally ingrained throughout the whole supply chain around the world that it's going to be uh, virtually impossible to switch. So those against see now, buy now insist that fashion is unique in its complexity and the complexity of its operations, the diversity, the seasonality, the sizing variations of product, so we all know that fit and styling are a really big deal. The sheer number of SKUs managed is mind-boggling. I mean, it's crazy to think how many products are managed in a new season. Um, and then, of course, there's a hugely sophisticated supply chain and then retail, ch retail channels, distribution models that go behind all of this or after the fact. So a lot of people argue that what works for other industries in terms of bringing new products to market will not necessarily work for our own. Whichever side of the debate you fall on, though, it's difficult to argue with reality. Today, the runway calendar is tied very closely to the processes of design, development, and distribution that make up the typical product life cycle. 
the two do not exist in isolation. And although the idea of an inbuilt delay might be outdated, it's not artificial. For a product or collection to reach market, many activities must happen. Typically, fabrics are researched, silhouettes are sketched or developed, prototype garments are made, reviewed, adjusted, trim is determined, prototypes are reviewed, adjusted again, um, product cost estimates are gathered and prices are set, products are organized into collections, and then shown to media and buyers, likely tweaked further, and only after that placed into production with fabric and trim orders placed and factory capacity secured. At the time that clothes appear on runway models, they're really enhanced prototypes, not quite sellable products. It's only after these shows, with commercial commitments secured, that what we call the process of productization or normalization begins. The rough styles are made standards compliant, fabrics and production capacity are confirmed with suppliers, labeling and packaging are printed, <clears throat> and products are prepared for mass production in the requisite variations, quantities, and sizes that Stacy mentioned. Vitally, these styles that are shown often undergo refinement as a result <clears throat> of feedback received from buyers and the media. This has been a very important component of the runway cycle. The gap between runway and retail is not just used to get the prototype ready for production, but also to improve on it, influenced by the perspectives of this carefully chosen audience. So the current runway and retail cycles are very closely linked together. And the transition to a see now, buy now um, model will be challenging, but not impossible. So there's a lot of coordination that, that needs to occur. Um, many companies, so on a very basic practical level, many companies, as we know, um, take any major brand, they all have multiple product categories. So they will offer clothing, of course, sometimes men's, women's, children's, um, footwear, accessories. You could have a higher end line. You could have a ready-to-wear line. And cosmetics, of course, are, are a very important part of the fashion offering. So all of these different product categories actually require similar but subtly and, and, and deeply different uh, approaches. So the duration of their development cycle and their production cycles can vary dramatically. So if you take um, a typical cycle, say, for apparel, which could be quite short if you're fast fashion, but it could be 18 months, um, this cycle could extend out to two years for shoes. And this is not considering the cycles of sports or outdoor clothing, or more like a, a sport line, for example, if a fashion, a fashion brand is going to offer a sport line. Um, these products are often driven by innovations in performance fabrics, or even stylistic innovations. And these can take years, in fact, years and years to develop at the, at the, at the mill level. Um, it's extremely an extremely technical process. So the idea of coordinating all this um, is challenging to say the least. So reducing the gap between runway and retail will not be a simple effort, particularly when we consider that we need to coordinate not just the lead times for product development, but also the go-to market across different product categories and retail channels. For example, in store, teams need to have the heads up as to which products will arrive and when and how to merchandise and sell them. And you can imagine the challenge that this faces um, you know, with stores across the world, London, Paris, New York, uh, LA, uh, coordinating all of this in one big bang um, go-to market is challenging. And the thing is, you, you better be prepared because today's consumers know more about your product than you do. Um, it's not uncommon, for example, that, I mean, everyone does this now. You see something you like, you research it. Uh, you, you study the price, you figure out what colors it's available in, the sizes, et cetera, et cetera. You go to a store and try it, and then you have a clueless salesperson um, who just kind of turns you off and, and ruins the whole experience for you. So, so no brand or no retailer wants to be in that position. Um, at Centric, we're, we're pretty lucky in that we've worked with over 150 different brands, retailers, and manufacturers. And although each of these companies' priorities and processes are different, they're all unique, we see a couple of common options um, that come into mind in the, in the spirit of trying to achieve uh, anything approaching a, a see now, buy now model. So there are two, two basic things um, that, that stand out for us. The first is the idea of compressing pre-production. So this would involve a, a setting a creative cutoff date 
uh, and then committing to the commercialization of products two to three months in advance of the event. So the runway event, it could be an in-store event, it could be a televised event. And then the second um, big pillar would be to operate pre-production and then production both in parallel. So of course, there's a lot of coordination and each of these options has um, some advantages and disadvantages. So with design decisions traditionally being made in the dressing rooms at the show, uh, ceasing artistic input eight weeks or more in advance of the event is likely to have a negative impact on the uh, trend acuity and then the design integrity. So it's more than just compressing lead times, this approach cuts short the creative window. So that is a, a definite risk to an industry that is, of course, based on newness and creativity. The second option involves operating traditionally sequential processes in parallel. So this allows the creativity um, to continue, to flourish, but there's a caveat um, that it will be necessary, there will necessarily be a disconnect between the two, between what is shown on stage and then what is um, actually sold. So let's talk about the benefits and the risks of this evolution. Um, the outcome of the debate here is anything but certain, but our research suggests that any business that is able to manage the move to the see now, buy now model could potentially see several key benefits. Currently, the major upside of the immediate model is likely to be publicity. Beyond industry press, mainstream media and consumers are being exposed to this debate, and there's no doubt that seasonless, shoppable shows will attract a dedicated audience of fashionistas, critics, observers, and even competitors. For those designers and brands who can achieve the levels of organizational excellence required to do it, the sheer media buzz might prove worth the effort. Aligned closely with this, consumers are likely to pay much closer attention to brands that are capable of aligning show dates and street dates. Currently, as proponents of the See Now, Buy Now model put it, maintaining interest of consumers for months is not really sustainable, whereas in an immediate model, no sustained marketing or other efforts would be required, and it's likely to result in better consumer engagement and loyalty consumers would leave that experience feeling really good about the product that they just saw and then can take home within hours or days. Similarly, aligning shows with retail availability could improve retail intelligence. Currently, products are marked down because of a confluence of factors, including proximity to trend, quality, marketing, and a host of other reasons. By making them available to buy as soon as they are unveiled, marketing, and perhaps trend acuity can be removed from that equation. Certainly, brands would get much more immediate and direct feedback from consumers. Costly traditional marketing campaigns can be reduced or eliminated. Today, a luxury brand could spend millions in print and online advertising to keep its next seasonal collection at the forefront of consumers' minds for months. A more immediate model would allow them to focus more on an initial push and then embrace more experimental avenues, and engage consumers even more. All of this, perhaps, could conspire to help fashion com companies claw back profitability. After all, the businesses pushing these changes aren't charities, and although we can second-guess the reasons, they must believe there's money to be made with a new model. But fittingly for a conversation about finances, any attempt to break the current cycle is likely to come at a cost. So we will talk about the risks. The task for any organization looking to implement a see now, buy now model will be balancing the rewards of immediate engagement, powerful publicity, and safer intellectual property against a roster of different risks. It's inescapable, as we mentioned, that as soon as a company stops actively designing its products, those products begin to fall behind the times. And for brands and designers accustomed to leading the discussion on style, this could be a difficult challenge to overcome. Also, it's important to remember that compressing pre-production and production cycles will not come without its casualties. In light of the challenges brought about by fast fashion, lead times for all product categories have already been compressed within most businesses. The pressure on creative teams is therefore more pronounced than ever, and it's already led to an exodus of staff from some extremely noteworthy brands. 
This focus on speed is likely to also influence the direction of the industry as a whole, shifting the mindset of key players from a creative one to a commercial one, leading to a more risk-averse approach to style and creating an unwelcoming environment for the next generation of design talent. With shortened lead times already a significant factor, many businesses are leaning on their suppliers, passing on the pressure of market expectations downward in the supply chain to some degree but an immediate model could strain this relationship even further. In some cases, the delay inherent in logistics between production in East Asia and delivery to Europe or the US may require brands to abandon their current supply chain partners and move to proximity sourcing simply to cut down on shipping times. That portion of the supply chain currently dedicated to um, moving goods from one location to another could be re redeployed to more value-added activities or eliminated. If creatives are allowed to continue working on prototypes that have already been committed to productization, the version seen on stage is likely to be closer to trend, more adventurous, and generally more fashionable than the version that was sent into, into mass production weeks or months earlier and the version that will eventually reach store shelves. For consumers exposed to the show, as is the goal of this direction in favor of immediacy, this could lead to a drop in perceived quality as they buy on the strength of the revised product shown only to receive the less on-point production version. More importantly, in an in industry where Agile has become vital in order to maintain margins, compressing pre-production and production will raise the stakes of internal collaboration and require massive organizational and process change. Fortunately, um, there is a very important technology that, has, uh, that can help with all this, and, and that is, of course, um, PLM, or product lifecycle management. Um, as we call it at Centric, it's, it's modern product lifecycle management. So th this PLM has shown, uh, has already been proven to show, uh, to improve productivity of, of every actor or every person involved in the design, development, sourcing, and production processes. We at Centric say modern because you need a modern tool, um, one that takes advantage of things like cloud, SaaS, mobility, uh, in order to then have a modern way of working. So um, at Centric, as I mentioned before, we have about 150 different uh, fashion companies using our PLM solutions. And almost universally, these customers, whether they are huge multinational luxury groups or very small brands, they have used PLM to help improve their speed to market and also to help manage change and process clarity. Um, mobility is huge, uh, not to steal that word from Donald Trump or anything, but the impact really is huge <laughs> because you can actually work in real time and it's, um, it's very liberating to not be chained to your desk and uh, many, many people are pretty happy with that. They, they feel pretty productive and pretty fulfilled professionally speaking when, they, when they're able to be uh, very reactive. So the organizational benefits of, of PLM are, are also well documented. So while compressing overall development time and um, the over, compress, sorry, compressing the overall development time will reduce the duration of each individual process a modern PLM can then support the high-level orchestration of these processes so that your macro process can be optimized uh, and that means it can also be run in parallel to some degree. So um, how can PLM help? Well, PLM has helped brands, retailers, and manufacturers around the world better understand, and this is the next slide, Lisa, um, PLM has helped uh, all of these companies around the world to better understand their processes, so really get into the detail of how they work so that they can start to look at um, how to become more agile and also more efficient. Uh, they do this without increasing headcount. Uh, they retain the flexibility to shift supply bases, target new markets, and introduce new product categories. In product development, production planning, sourcing, and execution, PLM enables faster, better decision making. This is a necessity for any business looking to embrace immediacy or see now, buy now. The luxury of committing to a fabric and capacity orders after a show uh, with any business embracing see now, buy now 
will benefit uh, from PLM's robust supplier management ranking and tracking modules, allowing for more responsive, reactive, and real-time relationships with both proximity partners and also those partners that are a bit further away. Um, we have uh, at Centric mobility, mobility solutions or mobile solutions apps that help with minimum order quantities, for example, so that you can actually commit closer to market. At the sales and marketing stage, PLM is instrumental in ensuring that every product sold has full supporting information. This might be inspiration, sketches or notes, a complete archive of digital assets to accompany the product's journey from design through commercialization or into the sales process with digital catalogs, for example, populated by images from the same centralized database uh, as the technical specifications. This is really in terms of product description, um, pricing information, uh, regulatory information. There are tons of examples of how PLM can, can increase, increase collaboration and also reduce time to market. So a couple of those are the idea of being able to do a fit review where you have multiple people in the room, either together or virtually. So you have a fit model and then you maybe have a technical person, you have a designer where you're taking measurements, you're inputting feedback, you're taking um, pictures, well you can do all that stuff with an iPad and you can have multiple people that contribute and then everything is collated together and then you can see all the fit comments in one place. So that's pretty cool. Another kind of uh, interesting use of, of PLM to save time is being sure that your product specification and documentation and shipping information is accurate and well organized and this can help you get pre-clearance with customs so that your goods are not waiting at the border just um, due to administrative uh, hiccups or, or incomplete information. So there are tons of um, ways uh, here and there that, that PLM can help. One of the really interesting things that's happening with PLM now is that it's, it's, a, it's entering in a different phase in terms of its uh, maturity level and what it can really do for companies. So in the beginning, when companies implemented PLM, their main focus tended to be on operational efficiency, so either in terms of cost or time, or some combination of the two, so improving go-to-market or uh, reducing cost or reducing waste. And now that companies are more and more starting to master this, they're looking at PLM to offer strategic benefits, such as agility, faster decision-making, the ability to experiment more, to fast with different initiatives, um, because a lot of transformation initiatives in a company actually fail and can be quite costly if not managed correctly. Of course, the, the one transformation initiative that works really well can be a home run. Um, and you know, these, these things are needed, they're necessary in, toward, in order to keep evolving the business. So this is, a, this is a sentiment that's actually echoed by Gartner, and they just came out with a, a study on what they call bimodal PLM, um, no, no pun intended with that one, um, but it's really talking about how PLM is evolving from a purely strategic tool to a strategic one, so that's pretty, um, uh, sorry, purely operational tool to a strategic one. So that's pretty exciting. So Lisa, over back to you. There's no single solution here. I think that's clear. Um, while fashion industry has undergone transformations before, for example, the introduction of ready-to-wear, the emergence of e-commerce more recently, this immediacy is the most dramatic shakeup in a century, and it's unlikely that a single operating model would work across luxury, fast fashion, mass market, and everything in between. While P with PLM, the right tools to support the see now, buy now revolution exist, and Centric Software is already helping its unmatched roster of high-end brands prepare for this uncertain future in their own unique way, with small steps to align their priorities. So before we turn it over to the Q&A, um, we just have a, a couple of last messages for you. So just to tell you a little bit about Centric Software, because we're actually um, we're actually really cool. We we really have a great team, and we genuinely have fun at work. And I think our I think our customers feel this. So uh, Centric creates technologies for the world's leading brands, retailers, and manufacturers. Our PLM platforms, mobile applications, and agile deployment methodology are all exclusive to fashion, retail, and fast-moving consumer goods markets. So that's all we do. Um, unlike others who see, perhaps see, see now, buy now um, as a hurdle to be overcome, we are interested in the people and processes behind it. 
and we help fashion companies prepare themselves for, for the future. So for the past four years, um, we've, been, we've experienced incredible growth. Uh, we have really been validated by the market as the leading PLM um, in our space, and we're really, really, really proud of that. Um, it's, it's a tremendous achievement. Uh, we are backed by some of the world's, I'd say, really great investors, so very uh, discerning investment partners. We're Silicon Valley based, and these investors are extremely supportive of us. Um, very proactive with us, so it's, it's really a, a great team. And finally, um, in terms of our team of top experts, we all work really hard, we really have fun, like I said, and we're very, very proud of our company, our product, and we're honored to work with such amazing customers. So, you know, we have customers that range um, all over the board, from Le Boutin to Crocs, uh, Desigual, La Perla, uh, Derek Lamb, Under Armour, Asics, so a lot of big ones and, and, some, and some smaller ones. Um, so there's a whole uh, list of these guys, so um, we're very honored to, uh, to work with them every day. Um, in terms of the sources that we, um, where we got all this information for, the, for this webinar, Lisa, do you want to tell everyone about that? Sure. Um, we've listed here some of the sources of information that we pulled in doing research for this, including the business of fashion, Kurt Salmon, Just Style, CNBC, Marie Claire, Centric Software's own information, and of course, all of our real life experiences. Well, okay. so thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for everyone to everyone for joining. And now we go to questions. Absolutely. Well, thank you to Lisa and also to Stacey. And I'm sure everybody will agree that was a really interesting and informative webinar. And I think it was, yeah, it was, it was a uh, a very interesting topic and I, I hope that we have some questions uh, or some more questions from uh, viewers today so if you have a question to ask I've got a couple here but if you have a question to ask please pop it in the, um, the questions box and I'll, pop, I'll uh, put it to both Lisa and Stacey now so please feel free to um, to get in touch but I do have a few questions here um, that I can put to you both now um, so here's the first one here um, uh, how do you think this shakeup is going to change the way fashion brands interact with the media? Um, you've mentioned reduced traditional marketing spend, but it seems to me like these brands are just going to sidestep editorial media like Vogue um, entirely and and, and in each do their own thing. So since lu luxury advertising funds um, a lot of traditional media, how is that going to affect the industry in the long run? Uh, this is Lisa. I can take that one. Uh, really interesting question. Thank you. Uh, I think the interaction of brands with media has already begun to change pretty significantly as print gives way to online and social media has taken a more significant role in uh, marketing and in a in consumer experience um, and also as part of that brands are using advertising as a way to promote an image as opposed to advertising specific products which is I think a more traditional mode so I think that that interaction has already begun to evolve pretty significantly um, I think there will still be a role for editorial and for traditional media. Uh, it might look a little different and it might move a little faster. Um, so I, I don't think the idea of brands continuing to market um, their image as opposed to specific products is going to go away anytime soon, but the way they do that um, will move to also more immediate um, media, if you will. Okay, thank you for that one. Um, I've got another question here as well. So um, you mentioned the impact that fast fashion is having on the high end, and this seems to be the high end response. Where does the mid market come in, and will they be squeezed from both sides? I can take that one too. Um, yeah, that's hard. I think that um, all brands will be pressured, whether high-end or mass market or whatever, to um, 
interact more with consumers. And I think even if they're um, not having a catwalk fashion show, they're having some kind of market in which they show product to their customers. Or even if they're vertical retail, they're doing that internally with their uh, internal buyers. Um, I think the idea of engaging consumers and getting feedback more directly from consumers will impact all brands over time. It might be a little more subtle and it might take a little longer time. Um, we didn't really get to this, but there's also this idea of um, big data and being able to really leverage the data that we get from consumer feedback to influence future design decisions as well as um, you know, what you decide to put into production. So yes, I think it will impact all brands over time. Okay, lovely. Thank you for answering that. I'm, I'm probably going to keep on with you at the moment, Lisa, I'm afraid to say, but I have another couple of questions here that I think you might be able to answer. <laughs> so um, first of all, this is, this is an interesting one. So um, how will or should retailers respond to the disruption in weather drivers that are disrupting the natural seasonal characteristics? Lots of liability merchandise is not floating around because it was out of phase with weather. Oh, that's such a good question. <laughs> it's actually one that's sort of been on, on my mind lately. So is it climate change that's driving, um, that's disrupting the seasonal cycle? I think to some extent it is. And with the advent of more high-tech uh, fabrications that become wearable year-round, I think the need for spring product versus fall-winter product is reduced. Uh, and that facilitates this idea that some of the luxury brands that are moving towards immediacy have put out there, which is seasonless fashion. Now, newness, the idea, uh, uh, the need for and the desire for newness doesn't go away, but I think this could potentially open up a creative channel for designers and allow them to focus on newness with less concern for weight or weather-related um, concerns. Okay, I hope that answers the, uh, the question there. Um, I've got one here. Which brand? And can, I, and can I? Go on. Sorry, Stacey. I'm in. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> well, I w I've been thinking a lot about this too, and I, I think I think two one of two things. Well, I think one of two things is going to happen. You're, you're going to see some brands that go seasonless, like that. That is their new DNA, um, and you know there are a lot of advantages to that. They don't want to take the risk of weather, and plus, you know, in today's day and age, unless you're outside hiking. The reality is that you can wear uh, the same weight clothing pretty much year-round because you know we do have things like heating and air conditioning, um, and I think so. I think definitely you'll you'll see brands doing this, and in fact there are there are a lot of new brands that focus on that. And then the other the other thing that will happen is, in general, I think there are going to be a lot more niche brands, especially now that there are um, you know it's much easier to bring in a young brand to market now than it than it would have been you know 20 years ago but you see a lot of small niche brands popping up where you will see people who only or brands who only specialize in one sort of product with maybe a main theme so this could be like merino wool for example i saw a lot of that at, at uh, uh you know in the press and then at different shows and, and in top stores and things um so you know we'll, we'll definitely have people that you know specialize only in like uh puffy coats or uh you know, super cold weather weather products, but that that's the beauty of the of the changes we're seeing in the fashion industry is that now as consumers, you know, we have access to everything, or as industry people, you're able to have much more flexibility than you might have had in the past. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, right, what have we got here? We've got which brands would you consider have managed this successfully today, and the impact on their business. I think the jury's still out on that. It's a little early to know what's going to be successful. Okay. Yeah, actually, we 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 did ask. I I did um I did ask around some of our our customers at uh, at, at Centric. So I I don't want to name names, but some of the ones who did um, say in the press, and there are quite a few of them. I I can there are at least five of our customers that have that have said that they were moving more toward this model, and we did try to interview them, and they they are I think uh, still figuring it out themselves. 
So um, it's very, very new for, for, for a lot of people. And I think in the next year or so, we're really going to see some, some, some clarity on this. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, I've got another one just come in. How about big box retailers, private label businesses? Does that change, or will it feel as if they will follow trends further behind? Hmm, good question. Yeah, so good. So good. What did you answer, it, Lisa? <laughs> Sorry, girl. <laughs> Thinking. Um, like putting you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm just. Uh, if, you, if you don't, if you don't want to go, if you don't want to answer, don't. No, it's fine. I'll, I'll take a stab at it, and then Stacey, you should chime in as well. Uh, I think the, the box retailers okay. and private label have um, been successful because they've followed trend. They've taken successful styles, modified them, um, made them less expensive and more accessible. Uh, I don't really see that changing. They go with the safer styles. They're not fashion leaders. Um, I think they'll continue to follow and knock off and be later in their delivery. But I think the customers who are shopping those lines aren't looking as much for newness now. They may face heightened competition from fast retail, and that could impact them, them more. In fact, there have already been, in, even in the past couple weeks, a slew of articles about the shift away from department stores. Um, and I think the big box retailers could be included in that. So um, I think the immediacy could lead consumers more to fast fashion and companies who are able to deliver faster, and that would impact their the uh, private label. Stacy, did you? Yeah, want to this, this is this is a, Yeah, this is this is interesting. It is one of the things that Lisa and I discussed when we were preparing for this webinar, and that is the idea that um, you know fast fashion originated in Europe, and uh, so so in a sense. The, the industry here or the business here has been disrupted uh, all, already and, and they kind of, I think brands and retailers here have gotten into the habit, you know, they have the expectation that these fast fashion companies will follow. So their, their sense of immediacy is a little bit different. They're not as, I think, disrupted by the, the, the idea of immediacy because it's moving in that direction anyway. Things are moving faster and faster anyway. In the U.S., of course, where a lot of the big box retailers and, uh, and department stores are are still based, I mean, most of these, at least what I think of, maybe I'm misinterpreting the question, but I think of these a lot of the big American brands um, that, of course, are, you know, they're they're really hurting and they're really being impacted by this change. Um, you know, they're 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 the ones right now that are are going through this this difficult period. You know, there, there are two there are two ways you can look at look at things in life. You know, when this happens, it's either you know you you sit there and suck lemons or you make lemonade. So, um, it is an opportunity to change. It's an opportunity to do business differently. And uh, I don't think it's impossible. You know, there's some very good examples of big box. Uh, brands that have been successful, like Old Navy right now in the U.S. is extremely successful. Um, J. Crew is one that, you know, for a while there, they were just the bee's knees. I mean, they were, like, design-wise, ahead of the curve, um, you know, going up market. Unfortunately, I think they had some, perhaps some other 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 issues that, that are causing them to hurt right now, but you look at, um, oh, I'm having a brain cramp, the other J. Crew brand that's doing really, really well. I mean, so they're, you well. know, uh, Maybell, thank you. So they're doing they're doing extremely well right now. So so it's not just a you know it's, it's a question of strategy and it's a question of what what you decide your brand is going to be and and of course that brand identity or as they call it now a brand relationship with the consumer has to be in line with something like this. And this is an interesting question actually leading on from this. I think it says Amazon is now developing its own private label products. Do you think the e-commerce giant could potentially champion this see now, buy now trend? Yes, <laughs> I think Amazon yeah. is the ultimate in, in immediacy. Even yeah. though you know they're just getting into developing their own things. I mean, here, here's a company who knows about you know they know how to execute. They know how to get stuff mm. done. I mean, you can you know in some cities have things delivered in an hour. So. Uh, there's no reason to think that they that they won't be able to manage something like this as well. Yeah, absolutely. And they have the data from all of the third-party lines that they've been selling and delivering for years. So they're yeah, I agree they're in perfect position to lead the foray here. Yeah. 
Mm. Yeah, I think their knowledge, their their knowledge and the access is. I think it's a very good point, Lisa, that the knowledge that they have been able to accumulate over the past couple of years, um, you know, because they didn't rush to market with their own brands. I think they were extremely strategic and extremely smart about this, where they're going step by step and like. You know, like many things that Amazon does, when they when they hit when they hit you with something, it's going to be a knockout. I think it's going to be right. big. They're, they're, right now, people are predicting that they're going to be what the biggest the biggest um, fashion retailer in the U.S. by, by what 2020? I thought I read maybe 2025. By 2020, they're going to have something close to 20 percent of the apparel market. Yep. Yeah. An astonishing number. Mm, it is, yeah, it's it? crazy. Okay, and uh, we have one, another one here. You mentioned four years of consecutive growth in PLM for fashion. Uh, what are the kind of businesses who are buying PLM and why are they doing so? Is it just a big enterprise technology for huge brands or can the market as a whole, even the SME end, get value out of it? Um, yeah, so I'm guessing that one's for me. Not yeah, me, I so. think it is, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we, we have a lot of different a lot of different kinds of sizes of companies. So from those that have um, you know that are in the billions of, of dollars or pounds in terms of turnover um, to the ones that are are really you know a six person team or a five person team. So that's that's the beauty of, of, of PLM and also the challenge of it is that it's so wide in terms of um, depth and breadth of what you can do with it or what it can do for your business. Um, that there are a lot of like a million ways to answer that question. I'd say mm -hmm. probably the top thing that people people use PLM for today, whether whether they're small or big, but one of the first key things that they tend to do when they implement a project is they go after um, they use what we call core PLM. So this really has to do with the heart of product development and product specifications. Um, but of course, that's not always the case. We have some customers that use it just to manage their sample rooms because they do thousands and thousands and thousands of samples per week, like mega mega factories mm -hmm. uh, in China. Um, and then it could be we have some customers that really focus more on retail operations. So how to go and make sure that your products are being properly presented and merchandised in each of your you know hundreds or thousands of stores. So that's uh, you know that's a big deal in and of itself. Um, and then, of course, as I mentioned, we have uh, we have some very small companies that um, use it as well. So yeah, so it's a bit of it's a bit of everybody. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I think that's it for today. We don't want to uh, keep everybody away from their work for too long, do we? Good grief, the the apparel industry will come to a grinding halt if we uh, we carry on too long. <laughs> Um, so for <laughs> all of you out there that have found this really interesting, as you can see from your screens at the moment, there are ways to get in touch with uh, Centric Software if you do have any other questions, or obviously if you'd like to know more about PLM and, uh, and how it could help your business potentially. Um, thank you for all of you for logging in today and for taking the time to, uh, to view this webinar. We have recorded it. She says with her fingers crossed, hoping it's all worked. I have recorded it and uh, it will be available on Just Style. Uh, oh, sorry, a version of this event today will be available on Just Style within the next few days. And uh, you can then watch it again at your leisure and share it with your friends, etc. So um, thank you to Lisa and thank you again to Stacey for your time and your efforts. It was um, an excellent presentation and I do hope that, that um, we hear from you again in the future. Thank you, Heather, and thank you to all the participants. I hope you found this of interest. Fantastic. Thank Thanks, you. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye now. Have an awesome day. Bye-bye.